Well, after knowing the factors that are uh, affecting treatment uh, decision making from different perspectives, we now move on to the second plenary session of CHIME entitled Evidence-Based Medicine for Filipinos Deciding on the Choice of Therapy. Uh, as uh, stated earlier, I'm Dr. Marlene Ongat Mateo and I was tasked to chair this particular session which is aimed at recognizing the importance of uh, gathering valid evidences from literature and applying it in our choice of therapy to make it more appropriate and rational. And with us here today as a speaker is one of the pillars, if not the main pillar, of evidence-based medicine in the Philippines, actually, he does not need any introduction because his name has always been associated with evidence-based medicine and vice versa. So nevertheless, for those who do not know him, particularly the students, our tall guy, he is really tall, actually, in the field of evidence-based medicine, wants his introduction short. Dr. Antonio Miguel L. Danz is a graduate of the UP College of Medicine, a professor of the same institution. He is a well-known, ayon yung padagdag yung well-known, but totoo yun. And that's the truth, everybody knows that. He is a well-known clinical epidemiologist. And he is the founding president of PSGIM, am I right? No? Philippine Society of General Internal Medicine. So colleagues, let us all welcome Dr. Antonio Miguel El Danz. So good, good morning, everyone. I, I didn't realize coming here that I would be talking to so many medical students, but I'm really happy about that because I have so much good news for you. I'm going to start with a quick survey. Now, how many of you have had your tonsils removed? Wala. Lahat kayo may tonsil pa. Okay. When I asked this question about 20 years ago when I first gave this lecture, maybe one in 10 raised their hands. So how many of you are taking vitamin C? Okay. Mas marami. That's about 17.3%. Accurate kaming mga clinical epidemiologists. Well, one problem with tonsillectomies, which was done left and right in the 60s, is studies have shown that there are really a lot of medical options to the management of severe tonsillopharyngitis. And studies uh, on vitamin C recently came out, a uh, meta-analysis about five years ago. Parang may resonance ang chest ko rito. Can I reduce the echo? Um, so, well, what was I going to say? Yeah, vitamin C, shown in a recent meta-analysis published in the Cochrane Library, has no effect on immunity. Except, may exception, except if you live in the North Pole. If you're going there, take it. Um, and then there are more recent examples of outdated technology, beta blockers used to be contraindicated in heart failure nung panahon ni Dr. Parkash. No? Ngayon, indicated na siya. And uh, this drug, Avandia, used to be touted by the endocrine societies all over the world. Or, I mean, the rheumatology, ano ba to? endocrinology societies around the world as a new breakthrough in the management of diabetes turns out to increase myocardial infarction rates. So the first message, the first good news I have for you is this. Half of what we learn in medical school is wrong. Yes. Kaya pag inaral nyo lahat, marami kayong tatanggalin sa inaral ninyo. The problem with this is that we don't know which half is wrong. And we need to develop skills in that. No? Uh, and dami, just to show you, I got this from a good reference from Wikipedia. Um, if you look at the list of withdrawn drugs that were ever marketed in the world, this page never ends. 
Oh, and depending on when you graduated, these are the things you need to unlearn in pharmacotherapy alone. Okay? So it goes on and on and on. There's a few hundred drugs there uh, with very unexpected adverse events. So why, why is this happening? Why is there so many things uh, going wrong? Now, why are we prescribing a lot of uh, ineffective treatments and then taking, changing our mind? I'm going to propose three reasons. Uh, here's another study which is good news. No? Uh, well, mamaya pa pala yun. Ito, studies about how often do we ask questions about treatment. No? Uh, so a team of social scientists traced residents and found out that they would ask two questions that they need to read up on for every three patients that they see. If you ask this in, in a inpatient setting, you ask five questions for every one patient. So that's a lot of questions. And less than one third were pursued. So that's a lot of unanswered questions. The common sources were books and journals. Uh, the, the most, one of the most common sources was yung ano? Kung sino yung katabi mo? Pare, ano na nga ba yung gamot dito? And, then, okay. and these were the barriers they said, no? Lack of time. 60% didn't have the time to search. And 29% forgot they asked the question. <clears throat> Second study, readless weeks. If you ask medical students, how many of you read nothing in the past week? The answer will be 0%. So kayo, 0%, you're all well read right now. If you ask residents, and I see, I think there are a few residents here, medyo 15%. What do you think happens when you ask consultants, your faculty, our faculty, faculty everywhere? Tataas, bababa. Tataas. Pero it depends on when you graduated. The longer it has been since you graduated, the greater the possibility that you read nothing in the past year. And it's a big problem kasi we need to cope uh, with a lot of literature. This is Index Medicus. Panahon naman ni Dr. Balanag to. Nasa isang kanto ng library, like 1,000 volumes. One volume per month, you look for articles. It was such a terrible task, it became punishment during our years. No? Pag na late ka, index medicus, hanapin mo yung latest article on myocardial infarction. It was a literal punishment. No? At least now, it's in computer databases. Okay. And the third, so showed you two in data. No? We ask a lot of questions, we don't have time to find it. Uh, a lot of the, the older you get, the less time you have. The third is your performance. Something happens to your performance. The x axis here is years since you graduated, and the y axis is your score in a clinical exam that's pertinent to clinical practice. Sa tingin nyo ba ano yung direction ng curve? Gumagaling ka ba pagtagal? Hindi. Ang problema, yung mga narito sa kanan, sila yung gumagawa ng exam. <laughs> Kami yun. <laughs> yung sumasagot ng exam, nandito. Okay. So we need a new paradigm for continuing medical education. Hindi na pwede yung conference tulad nito. <laughs> we have to start learning on our own. No? Three reasons. We need the information. We ask a lot of questions but we don't have the time. And the older you get, the less time. And this affects our clinical knowledge. So yun yung introduction ng talk ko. <laughs> I have less slides for the talk itself. So I, I want to answer three, uh, show you three criteria kasi you need to become good at appraising studies. No? Uh, Vince pointed out you need to share decisions with patients. But what options will you offer? Your offers for choices of treatment should depend on what's in the literature. No? You don't want to offer patients treatments that don't work or treatment, treatments that have been shown to be harmful. So when you analyze 
this is the best way on your own analyze the literature as it comes out uh, there are three basic questions you need to ask to help you criticize the literature number one what was the study question number two what was the design and number three what was the answer I, I don't have time to teach you the details but I'm going to show you examples of why these questions are important. Okay, example, I need your participation here. Drug A reduces cholesterol levels by 20% compared to placebo. How many of you think that's a, this drug's a new, uh, good drug for doing that? Um, how many of you think it's not a good drug? Okay. Can I ask everyone to raise your right hand, please? Okay, so nobody with disability here, okay? okay. Uh, now keep your hands up, please. And then if you think this is a good drug, keep your, put your hands down. Okay, so naging 76.2%. Now, second question. Drug B increases cardiac output in patients with congestive heart failure uh, from an average of 35% ejection fraction to maas to 52%, barely above normal. How many of you think that that might be a good drug? Okay. And uh, last question. Drug C dilates the coronary arteries, increasing the diameter by about 10% in patients with coronary disease. How many of you think that we might be able to recommend this drug for treatment of coronary disease? Okay. These are questions asked by several studies. And in the next few lines, I'll show you what happened. Drug A is clofibrate. Aside from lowering cholesterol, it increased the rate of deaths from suicide and violence. So it was removed from the market. Drug B is a drug called Samoterol. It increased the red ejection fraction, but increased the risk of sudden death. And drug C dilates the coronary arteries. This is dipyridamol. The problem with dipyridamol is it dilates the normal ones. It doesn't have an effect on the sick arteries. So if you dilate the normal ones, you create this phenomenon called I heard coronary steel. So dipyridamol is no longer treatment for coronary disease. It's a test for coronary disease. If you take it and you get chest pain, you probably have coronary disease. So these are, these are examples of uh, questions gone wrong. No? Uh, Clofibrate, dipyridamol, and some other. And there's a whole mountain of errors uh, in questions that were not properly asked. And, and why do I say that? Well, they asked, if you ask, does it reduce cholesterol, dilate coronary arteries, or increase cardiac output, that's not a valid question for clinicians seeing patients. The real important questions are only two kinds. Will my patient live longer? Will they feel better? Can you think of any other reason you should give treatment than these two? It has been a philosophical debate for decades. People cannot think of, a, of answers other than this. And therefore, the questions should be, we should ask should not be about physiology, cardiac output, biochemistry, cholesterol, or anatomy, coronary artery diameter. The question we should ask should be about do patients live longer and do they feel better? Okay, so that's the study question. If you'll take home one criterion today, that's the most important one. Because if a study mon monitors only surrogate endpoints, don't waste your time. Wait for a better study or look for a better one. And that will help you remove from your leading, reading list about 90% of the published literature. Second question is, what was the study design? Quickly here. This is a study on, uh, used to be a drug. It's now a nutraceutical agent, L-carnitine. 21 patients, 
were given L-carnitine patients with heart failure and they were monitored or they had 20 of these 21 had dyspnea and then all, everyone had neck vein engorgement and edema and most were in class 4 no? when they were given the drug this is what happened and lucky nung drop no? Does, how many of you think that that looks good based on this table okay, looks good diba? but what should you ask for a comparison and fortunately, Gidini et al. had a comparison. 17 patients given placebo, and this is what happened. So, ang conclusion, anong conclusion nyo? Is L-carnitine effective? It's effective, but it's as effective as placebo. So, so is placebo. And placebo costs less. Now, placebo seems to be a term that uh, we ridicule a lot. It's Placebo is very important. It's one of the most effective medications known to us uh, because the act, it involves caring for the patient, showing concern, uh, etc. And why did this happen? There are four reasons why patients get better when given a treatment. Binigyan mo, gumaling. Four reasons. Number one, the one we always like to believe, Maybe the treatment worked. Okay. Number two, maybe it was a placebo effect. Not so bad, depending on on the cost. Because mura lang ang caring. You can you should not charge so much for that. Maybe the patient received other treatments. Sorry. And the last is maybe the body healed itself. That's the most common reason. 99% of illnesses, not diseases, 99% of illnesses get well on their own. When you have a cold, even if you don't do anything, your immunity will uh, relieve you of that cold. If you have a headache, if you rest, it could go away. We're not like cars. If you have a flat tire, you need to replace it. We're auto-inflating. If we have a flat, our tire inflates itself. So the message here, that's what's so good about being doctors. God heals most of the time. But we charge. Diba <laughs> okay yon? You have 99% success rate uh, without uh, doing anything. And the third is, so be conscious about the study design. What was the study answer? So quick example lang here. You know what statins are? Uh, there was a study which evaluated its effect in patients with near normal cholesterol because it increased survival in sick patients after an MI, in patients with angina, unstable angina. And this group wanted to know, oh, it also helped in patients with high cholesterol. So in, in an ever-expanding market, a, a group of people said, why not give it to almost everyone? No? Slightly above normal, let's give them a statin. And this is what they found in a randomized trial, almost 7,000 patients. Okay, take a good look at this. In the placebo group of about 3,300 patients, 1% had heart attacks per year. In the statin group, 0.7% had heart attacks per year. And this was, the p-value was 0 0.001, okay? I have a, it's effective, diba? Right? I have a question. Would this be a fair statement about the effect of the drug? It reduced the risk of heart attack by 30%. Is it mathematically correct? It's mathematically correct. What would you use? Would you say it's a 30% reduction? Or is it just a 0.3% reduction? They're both mathe mathematically true, okay? But many researchers like to report relative reductions because the treatment looks dramatic. Then if you report absolute reductions, okay? So always watch out in your results. Uh, and here's another study about absolute reductions. Alendronate to prevent spine fracture in healthy postmenopausal women. Oh, pag nagmenopause ka na, alendronate, no? Uh, and they monitored, what's the outcome here? 
fracture rates. Okay. In placebo, it was 1.2% spine fractures in five years. In alendronate, it's 0.7% spine fractures. So absolute reduction, it prevents fractures in 0.5%. If you ask a clinician, should they use this drug? This has been the common answer. Yes, if we treat a million, for example, we prevent 5,000 fractures, diba? You prevent 0.5%. So if you treat hundreds of millions, you're going to prevent hundreds of thousands of fractures. But if you ask people with an economic track of mind, the economists, this is what the economists will say. 0.5% is the same as one in 200. So I need to treat 200 patients once a day for five years. Average cost per day is 50 bucks. That's to prevent one fracture. So it's going to cost me 18 million to prevent one spine fracture. Which is, and where's that 18 million going to come from? It's going to come from funds for tuberculosis and uh, vaccination and uh, even from other non-health uh, issues, right? So the economist's conclusion is, yeah, we're going to prevent 5,000 fractures, but we're going to lose hundreds of lives from funds lost from essential healthcare programs. So one important thing to learn, ask the right question, but the second one for me, take home, would be this. No? In commercial medicine, our objective is to maximize effectiveness. The more drugs you give, the healthier the patient is. It's based on a philosophy of cumulative benefit. No? Nagdadagdag as dumadami yung drugs. So. And its assumption is based on infinite resources, the bottomless pocket. From the economic point of view, there's no such thing as an economic pocket. No? Even, or an economic pocket. A bottomless pocket. Mani Pangilinan has a deep pocket, no? but it's not bottomless. So we have to work on the concept of finite resources. And ibig sabihin yan, it's based on a philosophy of opportunity cost. If you spend on one thing, <clears throat> you lose the opportunity to spend your money on something else. Diba? Yun yung mangyayari if we spend government money on a lender name. So the objective of in true medicine now is not to maximize effectiveness, it's to maximize efficiency. If you're seeing a family whose maximum budget per month for healthcare is 500 bucks, you need to stretch that 500 bucks to give them, uh, take them the longest mile in terms of health. So those are the two things you should remember. Finite resources lead to opportunity costs. Well, here's the graphic representation. Healthcare, x-axis, food, y-axis. Under infinite resources, you can spend as much as you want on health and not affect food. Or you can as eat as much as you want and it will not affect your healthcare funds. But there's no such thing. This, you can even increase both if you want. The truth is the more you spend on health, the less you have on food. And the more you spend on food, the less you have on health. So that's opportunity cost under finite resources. And this is the ultimate example of opportunity cost. No? Person survived the heart attack but was killed by the bill. It's a cartoon, eh? it's funny. Kaya lang like all cartoons, there's a painful truth behind it. No? I've actually met people who died because of the bill. Not my bill, not someone else's bill. So in summary, three questions to ask, important. What was the study question? Beware of wrong questions. Seek clinical endpoints. Do patients live longer? Do they feel better? What was the study design? Uh, beware, because most diseases heal by themselves. Therefore, you need to seek trials uh, showing that, in fact, it's better than doing nothing. And what was the study answer? Beware exaggerations. And these exaggerations are very common because healing, at the end of the day, is a business. The biggest warning I left for last, beware of ourselves. 
we are in the business of healing and we have our conflicts of interest. We believe that what we studied is the most important thing known to mankind and that the drugs uh, we have studied or the drugs that we have endorsed, they're the most effective drugs known to mankind. But we're earning from teaching about these drugs and we're earning from prescribing these drugs. Uh, and we're earning from doing these studies. So we need to be uh, beware of our own self-interest. I could not possibly give you all the angles about evidence-based medicine. There's a small book available around, wonderful, well-written, concise book, uh, Painless Evidence-Based Medicine. My conflict of interest, ako yung author. <laughs> But don't worry, it's, it's available everywhere. So you, my, my students are all telling me, asking me to sign photocopy <laughs> books <laughs> or, or showing me. Ito ang sinabi niya sa, nandun sa downloaded version. Okay. Yeah. okay, now we talked a lot about Western, Eastern, traditional medicine, uh, integrative, etc. Uh, and so I added this last slide. For patients, there's no such thing as Western, Eastern, modern, or traditional medicine. That's a doctor's, these are healthcare providers' concepts. When it comes to patients, there's only two kinds of medicine. Medicines that work and those that don't. And you need to be very good at making the distinction. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Dance, for that very animated, simplified, but comprehensive talk. Dr. Dance really provided us a take-home message. I did so that just to show that I really listened. Okay. Now, three important, uh, important pointers that we need to remember in appraising the literature regarding effect of medications. So, we, students, please remember that. Okay. So, and I think the best take-home message is beware of self-interest. So thank you, Dr. Dance. And in the interest of time, I don't think we'll have time for open forum. So we'll award this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Dance, through which reads us, simply lang, the Philippine College of Chest Physicians Council on Health and Integrative Medicine awards this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Antonio Miguel L. Dance, a speaker on EVM for Filipinos deciding on choice of therapy, given this, uh, ano bang araw ngayon? 12th of November, so, ano na, ha? So, signed by, of course, Dr. Maxokani as the chair of the Council on Health and Integrative Medicine, and, of course, by our beloved president, Dr. Patrick Morale. So, Dr. Dance.